Hello, my name is Maria Konczelska and welcome to Perlan Daily Culture. We've been talking about the constitution of 3rd May, the uniqueness of this bill and the beauty of its preamble. Here with us is Professor Richard Batterwick Pavlikowski, an expert in Polish-Lithuania history, but also an author of the book, The Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Thank you very much for being with us. Good morning. I would like for you to tell us, unfortunately, about this, this dark moment when the, the beautiful time of those 14 months of the Constitution, which it lasted, was broke down and how the Constitution was abolished. The Empress Catherine II was never going to tolerate the strengthening of the Commonwealth by the Constitution, and nor was she going to tolerate the rejection of her guarantee of the Commonwealth's form of government previously, which the same had broken in the autumn of 1788. So it was a question of when she would take her revenge and not if she would take her revenge, and also how she would take her revenge. Now, she had finished her war with the Ottoman Empire by the beginning of 1792. And so there was, she began to uh, amass the forces necessary to invade Poland and Lithuania. There was a group of malcontent aristocrats led by Szczęsny Potocki, Ksawery Branicki and Severin Zewuski in the crown or the Kingdom of Poland, and by the brothers Kosakowski in the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. And she did not want to fight a war between Russia and Poland. She wanted to intervene in a civil war. She wanted to take one side against the other. And so these traitors, and there's no other word for them, created the, the Confederacy of Targowica in the Polish crown, and the Confederacy of Vilna or Vilnius in the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. And they moved in behind the Russian armies uh, in an effort to take power, but very few people supported them. But nevertheless, the Empress insisted that the king simply join the Confederacy of Targovica rather than negotiate with her to try and find some kind of compromise. Now, no one seriously expected that the Polish-Lithuanian armies could beat the Russian armies in a war, but they did do quite well in fighting their retreat and beating them back. It might not have been impossible to have defeated the Russians in battle before Warsaw. But we won't know that because the king bowed to the pressure and he was supported by a majority of the ministers in Warsaw and he joined the Confederacy. The war, undeclared, uh, came to an end with its outcome still in doubt. The result of that was that the Confederates, supported by the Russians, abolished the Constitution. They forced the King to renounce the work of the Great Parliament, or same, and they instituted an oppressive and incompetent counter-revolutionary regime. Which destroyed the situation, I mean, all the achievements of the Constitution, and moreover, led it to the partition of Poland. That's right. The uh, Empress was not satisfied by the work of the Confederates. It was in her interests, uh, given that the Prussians, who had betrayed the Commonwealth, having been their allies, they had betrayed the Commonwealth in 1792. The Prussians wanted territory in the West, and she could take four times as much territory in the East, and it was all the more convenient a moment because the Austrians were busy fighting the French, and so they wouldn't have to be given a slice as well. And so the second partition took place in 1793. And just like the first partition in 1772, the Commonwealth's own parliament had to ratify the amputation uh, of its limbs. It was cut down to a very small torso. 
Well, this provoked the insurrection led by Tadeusz Kościuszko uh, in 1794. Kościuszko had previously distinguished himself fighting the British in America and then fighting the Russians in 1792. But that too was brought down by superior Russian forces and so the third partition completely dismembered what was left of the Commonwealth in 1795. And two years after that, the three partitioning powers of Russia, Prussia and Austria signed a secret convention to say that neither the name of the Kingdom of Poland nor the title of King of Poland could ever be used again so that the memory of Poland would fade away. Well, fortunately, it didn't fully succeed, but it led it to almost, it led it for many years of, the, when, until the end of the World War I, Poland was disappeared with some small um, differences during the Napoleon time, but basically Poland disappeared from the maps of Europe until the, uh, the end of uh, the World War I. Well, that ambition to erase it not only from the map, but also erase it from memory, uh, had failed within a generation. Uh, because after the struggles of the Napoleonic era, when there was much uh, attempt to restore Poland by force of arms, ultimately defeated. But at the Congress of Vienna, a very small kingdom of Poland under the Tsar uh, was restored. It wasn't properly independent. And after 1831, it was very firmly governed uh, by the Russians. But yes, uh, the idea of an independent Polish state that was only uh, restored in 1918, at the same time as an independent Lithuanian state, no longer together, independent and separate states. And the memory of the Constitution played an important part in this. It was a symbol of the desire for independence, sovereignty and freedom. The actual content of the Constitution became much less important as the years passed, but that symbol that the Commonwealth had the will to live and that it was capable of governance seeing itself, that it wasn't a failed state, uh, but that it had been brought down by its neighbours precisely because it was reviving, that proved immensely important uh, to uh, the cause of Poland through that long 19th century and into the challenges that the 20th century brought. I would say that right now, eventually, after many years of struggle, only 20 years of independence after the World War I, and then, unfortunately, World War II Accord, and then the PRL time, and again, I was Soviet invasion over Poland. Um, after, 19, after 1981, right now we have the we have the independent Poland, the free Poland, which we can rebuild and and um, and govern by ourselves. What would be the message, your message, to Polish people right now, based on the tradition of the Constitution? Well, I have to say that uh, the 3rd of May probably means less to Polish people right now than it did, for example, in the 1980s. In 1982, there were massive demonstrations, not just here in Warsaw, uh, against martial law uh, and the communist dictatorship on the 3rd of May. Now, 1989, 1990, 1991, we have this process where independence, sovereignty and freedom are restored. And so the meaning of the Constitution as a symbol of the desire to restore independence is necessarily less important. It's the final day of a long holiday, uh, including the 1st of May, so lots of people go abroad on holiday and you know, official ceremonies are less attractive. But if we can think of the Constitution not so much as a symbol of the desire for independence, but as a lesson in what it's possible to do with independence, what it's possible to create through compromise and harmony uh, in, all, uh, in conditions of sovereignty, then I think we've got the real lesson of the Constitution. It's what you do with independence and sovereignty above all. Compromise and harmony, two crucial points which the Constitution of the 3rd May brought to Poland and if it could only last a little bit longer. But now we have the chance and this freedom. So let's learn on the history and do something beautiful with the future. 
and thank you very much for watching Poland Daily Culture.